Thank you, Stephen, so very, very much. Good evening. It is wonderful to be with you, and I thank you so much for the honor of joining uh, you here at the Oxford Union. What a, what a great privilege it is. Uh, uh, my wife, Betty, and I have been here in London, uh, here in England for uh, four days now, five days. Uh, uh, we spent yesterday at a rainy Stonehenge uh, and uh, over in uh, Bath to see the Roman Baths, so we've gotten a little bit of the flavor of the, uh, of the surrounding community. I wish you a uh, happy United States Thanksgiving. Um, I understand there are some U.S. citizens here. How many folks from America? Good group. That's great. We couldn't find any turkey this morning, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can find it on the way home. Um, uh, I have been, I, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, the United States healthcare system um, and uh, um, uh, some of the dynamics of the system, uh, some of the challenges that we have, and uh, uh, some of the solutions that, that I see. Um, and uh, by way of introducing that, I thought I would uh, spend a little time talking about my background um, and then run through that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that list. Uh, and then I look forward to questions and answers. I'm not going to talk about U.S. politics during my remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we are competing, the, uh, the uh, United Kingdom, England, and the United States, to have the most calamitous political uh, theater uh, uh, or around. I've noticed the, the headlines actually in our stay here uh, in, in the U.K. have gotten larger and larger and larger, so you know that the uh, import of what's going on gets greater and greater. Uh, but I want to share with you a little bit about my background because I think it, it, it kind of informs why I uh, believe many of the things I do about health care. Uh, I'm a third generation physician. My dad and my granddad were docs. Uh, my grandfather graduated from medical school in 1908, um, eons ago, right? Um, and as a child uh, in, in, the, in the early 60s, I remember vividly uh, going with him on the weekend to, to round and see his patients. Uh, that didn't mean uh, getting in the car and going to the hospital and seeing patients. That meant getting in the car and going to people's homes to see how they were doing. And as a child, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I remember we would pull up at these homes and we'd walk up to the front door. And in my childhood memory, I was thinking, what on earth are we doing here? Right? Uh, why, what uh, what, what, uh, what uh, import could we have uh, with, the, with these folks? And we'd knock on the door, and instead of people coming to the door and answering the door and throwing the door open and saying, um, who are you and what do you want? They would invariably say, again in my childhood memory, oh, Dr. Price, welcome, come on in, and they'd give him a hug. And I think what that did to me was to cement that incredibly important relationship between physician and patient that caring, loving, concerned relationship between physician and patient, caregiver and care receiver. Um, and I think that, that uh, one of the keys to quality in healthcare is that relationship. And that has colored um, my, my, um, uh, the way I have approached the solutions to the challenges that exist uh, in, in, in healthcare in the States. Uh, I did my undergrad in med school at the University of Michigan, uh, then went down to Emory University to do my orthopedic residency, spent about 20 plus years taking care of patients as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, then uh, uh, along the way in that, in that process, I got the bug to run for political office um, and ran for the state senate, served in our state senate from 1996 to 2004, um, and then uh, in, in the United States House of Representatives from 2004 to 2012, to 2017. Um, and then a very short stint as the first uh, uh, HHS secretary for uh, President uh, Donald Trump. Um, and I mention that because that experience uh, oftentimes results in questions to me about, uh, okay, Price, you're, you've had all this experience, you've had all this knowledge, all this work, um, what on earth would you do to fix the United States healthcare system? Um, and uh, I'm always amused by that question because it belies where we find ourselves in the states as it relates to healthcare. And that is that we don't have a healthcare system. Uh, we have healthcare systems. Um, so we have Medicare for seniors, we have Medicaid for those at the lower end of the economic spectrum. We have the exchange market, the Obamacare market, which covers only 11 million people out of a population of 320 million, and all the, all the attention that that, that that is seen. We have the, uh, uh, um, the employer-sponsored uh, uh, insurance coverage which covers the vast majority of the American people, about 170 million uh, of that 320 million are covered by their employer. Uh, 
Uh, we've got the VA system, we've got the Indian Health Service system, we've got the individual and small group market, you've got the private direct primary care market, and on and on and on. And so somehow we think, fancifully, uh, that, uh, that, that folks ought to be able to move from one of those siloed systems to the other seamlessly, and then we wonder why it doesn't work. So you can imagine a system that is that, uh, that cobbled together, uh, uh, if you will, and, and the challenges that exist in trying to, to uh, uh, have that move forward. Um, one of my goals has always been to harmonize the system because I think folks ought to be able to move seamlessly between those, those, uh, those siloed systems. Uh, that has been a real challenge. It used to be when my dad and my granddad were docs that they would charge patients who had a little more, a little more, so they could care for the individual that had a little less uh, and, and, and not, uh, not force them to, uh, to have to pay with something that they didn't have. Uh, it's called cost shifting. Um, doesn't, that, that really doesn't work anymore. In fact, it's illegal to do that now. Uh, but it, do, it wouldn't even work if it were uh, uh, possible to do so because of the technological aspects of our, of our current health care system. Um, so we still have a huge challenge, uh, and that is 28 million individuals are uninsured in the United States uh, out of, again, that, that total population of 320 plus million. So the goal has to be to get folks covered. You can't have a system that, uh, as large as ours, or systems as large as ours, uh, with so many people, um, uh, so many people uninsured. So uh, what I thought I'd do next is just to talk a little bit about some of the dynamics uh, of our healthcare system. But before I do, I want to touch on healthcare um, uh, and spending uh, in the United States. And you oftentimes hear, for those who are from the states and those who've studied health policy uh, uh, here, um, you, you've often likely heard that, uh, that the United States spends more than any other developed country in the world per capita on, on healthcare and yet has some of the, the lowest um, outcomes, quality outcomes. Um, and, and I just want to touch on that because I think it's an important topic to, to discuss. In terms of quality health care, I would argue that the United States has quality health care that is second to none. Second to none. The problem is, is that it is not uniformly distributed. And, and, and that's the challenge. It's not that the quality of health care is bad, it's that, the, that, the, that there are some in our society who are unable to access uh, that quality, which is a different challenge, different question to answer. And if you don't recognize, the, if you don't make the right diagnosis there, you're not going not to be able to, to, to solve that problem. For example, in the top five cancer diagnoses in the Western world, uh, the United States, uh, in terms of life expectancy, treatment for, and, and, and the life expectancy that one would have, uh, treatment for four of them in the United States, you would have the longest life expectancy with those four diagnoses. And the, and the fifth one, you'd have the second longest life expectancy. Uh, if you have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction in the United States you're, and you're in an in, in, uh, uh, urban or suburban area, the likelihood is that you will survive that in, in a way that allows you a longer life expectancy than almost anywhere else uh, in the world. So the quality is there. If you look at life expectancy, it's important to appreciate that we've got some cultural challenges in the United States that result in, as a matter of fact, the last two years, male life expectancy decreasing by a month each year, first time in the history of the country. Um, and and, and the, the things that result in, in that, uh, if you look, if you critically look at the numbers, if you remove, now you can't do this, but if you remove motor vehicle accidents, gunshot wounds, and overdoses from the numbers, the United States has basically uh, an, an equal or longer life expectancy uh, to any, uh, any developed, uh, developed nation. So again, if you look at the challenges that we have and make the right diagnosis, then it points you in the right, right direction. Uh, I've got a winter cold and I apologize, so if I have to put another lozenge in my mouth, you'll, you'll forgive me, please. Um, so because we don't have a system, we have, uh, the federal government has huge input into the systems that we have. Um, about 50% of all the money that is spent in the United States on health care now comes from uh, the federal government. About 50%, about half of, of all the money. And about 90% of the individuals that have health coverage have a nexus with the federal government. So it's a huge consequence of decisions that are made uh, at, at the federal level. We spend remarkable amounts of money on, on health care, $3.5 trillion on, on, on health care uh, in the United States. Again, a, a little less than half of that uh, by the federal government. In 1970, that number was $75 billion. 
So we've seen a remarkable, remarkable increase. Um, Out-of-pocket costs for an individual are about $1,100 uh, a year uh, for, for health care. In 1970, that number was $355. Uh, dollars. Um, and the gross domestic product that's, uh, that uh, uh, we spend on health care is about 17.9% last year. Uh, the UK is about 15%, 14.6%. So it's comparable, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the criticism that we get oftentimes is again that, the, that we don't get the results for it that, uh, that, that we should. So um, for the first time in the past two years, utilization of the system has been driving the increase in cost. It's no longer the cost of the provision of the service, it's the utilization. And that's due to two things. One is the, the ACA, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, that has increased the number of individuals with coverage. Again, that 11 million uh, group that, uh, that uh, have gone on to the exchange. And then the demographics of our society, an aging population, my generation, the boomers. There's 78 million of us who are trying to work through this system, and that has resulted in an increased uh, utilization. Um, so those are, the, those are some of the dynamics within the healthcare system that I think are important to keep in mind. <clears throat> in terms of challenges, there are, there are oh, I don't know, a half dozen or so challenges <coughs> that I want to address um, and then talk a bit, little bit about the solutions and then look forward to your questions. The first challenge I want to address is one that is incredibly important and one that I tried to bring focus to at, uh, at HHS uh, during, my, during my time there, and that is the opioid crisis. We have um, an incredible crisis in the United States in terms of overdose deaths. Last year, there were 72,000 overdose deaths in the United States, and over half of them uh, due, to, due to opioids. Um, a comparable number here in, in the United Kingdom, six, about 66 uh, overdose deaths per million in the United Kingdom. Our rate is about 250 per million in the United States, so a rate of about uh, four times uh, uh, the United Kingdom. <coughs> the crisis is real. Um, it is uh, um, really not well understood about why this is going on. There are a lot of, it's multifactorial in terms of, of, of uh, what's causing it, uh, but it is real and it hasn't, to, from my perspective, been addressed uh, as aggressively as it needs to. I have actually proposed um, something along the line of PEPFAR. Some, some folks will know what PEPFAR is. It's what uh, uh, George W. Bush, the uh, 43, uh, proposed to address HIV, AIDS, uh, worldwide which was the Presidential Emergency Program uh, t for uh, um, AIDS Reduction. Um, and I propose, and, it, and it, it, it's done incredible work, done remarkable, remarkable work in decreasing the risk of AIDS around the world. I propose PEP4, P-E-P-F-O-A-R, Presidential Emergency Program for Opioid Abuse Reduction. I'm unashamed in my, in my stealing of that, that, uh, that kind of acronym. Um, but I, I think that it's necessary because right now we've got these siloed systems within the United States federal government and they're not working together in a, in a cohesive manner. And only an interdepartmental agency, an interdepartmental project will in fact, uh, I believe, solve that, that challenge. So uh, it's something that has to be solved. The resources are there to solve it um, and I'm encouraging folks to do that. <coughs> Second challenge is the employer's role in coverage. As I mentioned, 170 million folks in the United States get their health coverage through their employer. Employers are seeing those costs rising. They're saying, wait a minute, what, what, what are we going to do? And they're, they're responding by changing some of the rules. So you've seen Amazon and J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway pair together to say, how can we take care of our hundreds of thousands of employees in a way that lowers our bottom line as it relates to health care? This past week, Walmart one of the largest employers in the United States, actually said, uh, have begun officially steering patients for certain treatment of certain diagnoses. So if you need spine surgery and you're an employee at Walmart now, you will be steered toward a specific uh, organization or entity to take care of your spine problem. And, and, and you'll, you'll do that by the incentives of if you go there, then there won't be any deductibles or co-pays. If you don't go there, then, then there will be some significant cost out of your pocket. They're doing that because they believe that certain areas have, have higher quality, greater efficiency, and lower cost to them as employers. And that's only going to increase, that is, employers getting more involved in these decisions. Workforce challenges. Um, depending on what study you read, there are probably 50 to 100,000 
uh, physicians short in the United States in terms of the number of docs that ought to be present per population, especially for certain, certain specialties uh, uh, in, in, uh, in healthcare. That's not going to change in the, in the short term. If public policy were to address that right now, and it really isn't something that's being talked about uh, with any frequency, but if public policy were to change right now in a positive way that would result in more physicians being trained, that pipeline is about 15 to 20 years long if we made a decision uh, today. So that's a, uh, that's a challenge. Drug prices, you've heard a lot of talk, uh, I suspect, about drug prices in the United States and, and, and how they're, they're too high, uh, according to many, and, uh, and, and the president and his administration has proposed reference-based pricing to Western Europe prices that are, that are extracted from the pharmaceutical companies uh, for certain, uh, for certain um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, I think that's a bad idea. Uh, I believe that uh, it may, in fact, result in decreasing resources for research and development. Uh, I think that problem is actually a trade problem and that the United States uh, would, would uh, do better to address the trade imbalances between uh, our nations uh, as it relates to, to uh, supply of pharmaceuticals. We're going through a merger frenzy in the United States now with, uh, with both horizontal and vertical mergers, um, uh, consolidation of the healthcare system, uh, all of which is, an, again, an attempt to, to decrease unit costs for, for the provision of services to, uh, uh, to the individual patient. Um, and some of that is good, uh, removes some of the waste. Some of that, I believe, is, is harmful because it actually decreases the ability of patients to affect the kind of care uh, that they want to receive. There's a continuum of, of regulation and innovation. Uh, we all want certain regulation in, in healthcare, but the more regulation that we have, I would suggest, results in decreasing innovation. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta have a balance there. And this administration is intent on decreasing the regulatory oppression, if you will, in the area of healthcare in order to stimulate that innovation, both on the clinical side and on the technical side uh, of, uh, of uh, providing coverage for folks. One area that's a challenge and, and, and uh, um, I think a significant change that we'll see that I'm really excited about is all of the artificial intelligence that's now available um, uh, in, in healthcare, the wearables. Uh, Eric Topol, T-O-P-O-L, wrote, wrote a wonderful book a few years back called uh, The Patient Will See You Now, uh, which talks about the democratization of medical information, healthcare information. And uh, patients now are able <coughs> to have huge amounts of information about their own health status, about their own, uh, uh, whether it's glucose, what their own heart rate is, what their EKG looks like, what their, uh, the, uh, all sorts of things, all th sorts of lab tests and the like. And they have it oftentimes in real time. <coughs> Excuse me. And the patients, the, the, this new generation, millennials uh, and the like, will change with, the, with the, uh, the artificial intelligence, I think will change how we in the United States as a society both deliver health care and, and receive health care. Because for an example, if a mom takes a kid to uh, the doctor and they have strep throat and they get, uh, the, the, the doctor treats the, the, the child and uh, three or four days later the doctor wants the, the child to come back, the child's getting better, temperature's down, playing well, <coughs> that mom has no desire to sit in that waiting room for two to three hours when she knows that she can take a picture of that throat, she can send the actual temperature of that child, she can, she can provide any other information to that physician in a virtual manner, uh, and, and they, I believe, millennials will demand appropriate changes to our healthcare system. Actually, very, very exciting. One more challenge and then a few solutions and then, and then, and then your questions, please. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the states is our demographics, <clears throat> and I alluded to it earlier. We're an aging society, uh, that 78 million uh, boomers. And we've got to get, <coughs> excuse me, through the system. Because of that, one of the consequences of that is individuals are leaving the insurance pool pre-Medicare, going into Medicare, and that's lowering by a percentage of the population the number of individuals in that pool, if you will, uh, both the uh, employer market and the exchange market. And that's raising the cost for everybody else in that pool. And, that's, and we're just at the beginning of the boomers retiring. This will take another uh, 12 to 13 uh, years to get, to get through. That's a challenge that nobody has been talking about in terms of how do you address those costs. So how about a solution? 
Um, I've been privileged to work for almost 25 years as a, as a public uh, uh, figure uh, in the area of, of health care and have put forward one of the most comprehensive, from my perspective, positive solutions as it relates to health care, the Empowering Patients First Act, which would allow patients to, to own and control their own health coverage regardless of who's paying for it. One of the real keys, basically a defined contribution system so that folks can move seamlessly between those siloed systems because they actually control the dollar. For each of those individuals that receive their coverage through their employer, the, the patients aren't making the decision about what kind of coverage they have. It's their, it's their employer or it's their human resources officer. That removes the patient from the ability to actually affect the system, affect the kind of care that re, they're receiving and the individuals providing uh, that care. <coughs> HR 2300 is the bill. If you want to look it up in the 114th Congress, you, you, uh, you can read about it. Um, uh, it, it's one of the things that, uh, that I think is really exciting in terms of, again, putting that patient back in the driver's seat so that you can continue to have that caring, loving, compassionate relationship between that caregiver uh, and, and that care receiver. Um, hasn't happened yet, uh, so, uh, but hope springs eternal and we'll continue to work on it. It's an incredible pleasure for me to be able to join you today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for those opening remarks, which I think framed the issue in, in, a, in a helpful amount of detail. I want to begin by looking at the politics of the healthcare issue. Uh, in the recent midterm elections, Democrats focused extensively on the message of healthcare. Do you think that repealing parts of Obamacare still ha uh, has a political win factor for Republicans, or is it simply old news and do people need to look at new solutions? I, I alluded to a couple times in my remarks that, that we're not looking at the right problem. I think there's a lot of common um, interest and a lot of commonality in, in Americans' perspective on health care. If you talk about principles, the principles of health care are such that, that our society basically believes that everybody ought to be able to afford coverage, <clears throat> everybody ought to have access to coverage, that the care ought to be of the highest quality, and that patients ought to be making choices. That's, that's basically the principles of health care uh, that, that, that we believe we ought to have in our system. Um, so if you look at, at, at the Affordable Care Act, there are certain areas where, from our perspective, my perspective, we violated those principles. We drove up costs for folks. Remember those 11 million individuals? They're paying more in terms of deductibles and premiums than they were before, and I would argue getting, getting less. Many of the choices that they desired were removed. Couldn't keep their doctor necessarily. Couldn't keep their, couldn't keep their plan. Um, and so if we violate those principles that basically all Americans believe in, um, then, we, then we head down the wrong path. That's why I think it's important to try to address those principles and come up with a solution that, that, that answers and responds to those principles. I don't think you'll see a, a, a repeal of, of the ACA. Uh, I don't think that's politically viable. Obviously, uh, last summer, the, the Congress demonstrated that they were not able to pass a repeal uh, of, of the ACA. Uh, so I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think that there are huge problems within our healthcare system that need to be addressed. And that's a common theme that you hear on, bo on both sides. The question is how you work through that and, and, and solve those challenges, because folks are still having problems out there, and we continue to have 28 million uninsured. Sure. You mentioned the opioid crisis in your remarks, and I wanted to ask to what extent you felt able to tackle that from an HHS perspective, or to what extent that becomes more of a law enforcement uh, gang issue? Because I know it's really a priority for President Trump's administration. Well, there's a supply side problem. We've got then we've got huge uh, uh, amounts of illicit uh, drugs coming into the states. Availability of those illicit drugs now uh, more powerful than ever, stronger than ever. Um, and that's where so many people are dying. There's no way to have quality control on illicit drugs, obviously. And many of these drugs are, are uh, uh, of such a, a, a power that they kill rapidly. Um, so there's a supply side problem, but there's also a demand side problem. Um, when I was at, at the department, uh, we, we uh, uh, in, were in the process of proposing uh, a strategy to address the opioid crisis that included making certain that, that we had appropriate resources for diagnosis and treatment and recovery, and that was, recovery was possible. There are many folks who believe kind of uh, um, categorically that recovery isn't possible. I don't believe that. I think recovery is possible. 
that, uh, that overdose reversing drugs, Narcan and Naloxone, ought to be universally available everywhere. Um, the, these, when, when folks overdose, that you need to have that drug there immediately to reverse the overdose. Uh, so they need to be uh, need to be everywhere. The NIH is doing incredible things. National Institute of Health is doing incredible things. They're working on a non-euphoric um, analgesic, a, a, a pain medication that doesn't result in that drug-seeking response or activity uh, from folks uh, who who, uh, who uh, are potential to become addicted. Um, the 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 whole why of all of this, the public health aspect of all of this. Why is it that we have 72,000 folks who overdosed last year? when again 15 years ago the number was 5,000. So it's, I mean, something has drastically changed. We haven't answered that question. And then finally, how we treat pain in the United States. We've, we've gone through a 20 year experiment in, in thinking that, uh, that, that, that pain was a bad thing. Uh, as a, uh, in fact, we, we instituted, the federal government instituted something called pain as a fifth vital sign about 20 years ago. I remember as a practicing physician, my head exploded when I got this letter from the from the federal government that told me that pain was now a fifth vital. Vital signs are things that are objective. They're blood pressure and weight and respiratory rate and pulse. And to tell me as a, as a clinician that something that is subjective, doesn't, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's subjective, is now uh, something that's, that's a sign uh, that is an objective finding, uh, just, just demonstrated their complete um, uh, lack of appreciation for the core problem. So those five things, I think, if we, we could institute that, would go a long way in solving the problem. And to what extent do you think the problem started because of the over-diagnosis and over-prescription of painkillers uh, for, small, for, for smaller day-to-day -day injuries? I think it has a huge, huge uh, uh, component, but, but you have to ask why are they being over-prescribed? Uh, we're, we're now beginning to see a decrease in, in, uh, in narcotic uh, uh, prescriptions uh, from, from, uh, from docs around the country. That's, that, that's resulted from an educational process uh, as well as um, uh, ability for, uh, for physicians to know whether or not patients have received medications from somebody else. There are patients who sometimes will have drug-seeking behavior. They'll, go, they'll shop, they'll doctor shop for, for, for the medicine. Um, so you got you to have a system that's actually working together and in concert so that you can, you can decrease the number of prescriptions. But it's an important question, it's an important point because there are some statistics that will, that will, uh, will demonstrate that about 80% of those who become addicted had their first experience with a narcotic with a legitimate legal prescription. And so you got to figure out how to make certain that those folks uh, uh, don't become addicted. I want to move on to looking at the issue of, of, of politics in America. And I want to begin by asking, when you endorsed Donald Trump during the primaries, uh, you said it was for the sake of party unity, that Republicans could only succeed if they were unified. How effective do you think Trump has been in unifying the Republican Party? Well, I think uh, that I, I had a conversation with some folks earlier. I think we're in the United States right now in a, uh, in a process of party realignment, of, uh, of uh, uh, realignment of the parties, and it's happening as much on the left as it is on the right. Uh, the left is, 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 is realigning around a set of, of core values and, and ideological solutions that are further to the left, progressive left, than we've ever seen in the United States take hold to the, to the degree that they, that they have now. Uh, the right is changing as well, and, and that's being led by, led by uh, President Trump. So if you, if you ask uh, how, how, uh, how is the president doing in, in, in uniting uh, what was the former Republican Party? I think that's the same kind of question as you would ask: How how is how is Bernie Sanders doing in in uniting the former Democratic Party? Uh, you've you've got a realignment that's going on, and it's a painful process when you go through that. But I think that's occurring. In fact, it's not just occurring in the states. You're seeing a realignment, oftentimes in in many uh, Western nations, where you're seeing more uh, more protectionism, more populism, if 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 you will. Uh, from a public policy standpoint. So I don't think we're unique. And as, as we watch that populist realignment in America, I think one of the things that people have looked at, particularly is elections in Georgia, where Democrats have made significant gains, even not winning seats, coming much closer than they had uh, five to 10 years ago. Uh, to what extent do you think Trump's realignment of the Republican Party is going to put off middle-class suburban voters? Well, that's a, it's a huge question, and, and it's a key that both, both parties have to be able to appeal to uh, the, that, that 30 to 40 percent of the folks in the, in the middle, if you will, the center left and the center, center right, in order to win. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a dynamic process. It's a pendulum, and it swings uh, back and forth. And we're in that process right now of trying to figure out, obviously, many of the suburban seats that, that we, the Republicans, won uh, 
in 2010 when we picked up 63 new seats and took the majority uh, by huge numbers in an in, in historic election um, in the first election after President Obama's original uh, election in, in 08. Many of the seats that we won were the ones that were, were, were lost uh, this time and returned to, uh, to uh, uh, democratic representation. So it's a, it's a dynamic process that, uh, that, that's occurring and uh, twas ever thus, right? I mean, it, 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 ours is an entrenched two-party system um, and, uh, the, and the parties have to figure out how to appeal uh, to that middle and, and, and I think it's important that, uh, that they do so based upon the principles that they, that they, uh, uh, they articulate and that they possess. The question is whether those principles among the parties are changing, and that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bigger question. In the recent uh, Georgia gubernatorial race, those principles were at times in doubt when there was an extensive discussion over the integrity of that race. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the focus on voter registration from Brian Kemp's campaign uh, was inappropriate? Uh, and do you think you should have stepped down earlier as Secretary of State? Uh, it, no, I, I think that it, it, there's precedent for the Secretary of State um, uh, overseeing elections in which there are candidates. So that's not, that's, that's not an unusual thing um, in, in, in the state of Georgia. Um, the press that, that, that Georgia got uh, in terms of uh, voter registration and the like, I found curious uh, because it, it, it identified uh, certain problems that one didn't exist um, and two, seem to be suggesting that the Secretary of State, in, who's in charge of elections, ought to ignore the law of the state in order to facilitate people to vote. I promise you that, that, that individuals who wanted to vote in the state of Georgia voted, and they voted in huge numbers. Uh, in fact, they voted in certain areas, my old congressional district, in numbers that we hadn't seen on the other side of the aisle. Uh, that tells me that the system actually works if you do the hard work of uh, the ground game uh, of, of voter turnout, of getting folks to the polls uh, who, who you want to get to the polls because uh, they either supporting your candidate or you have uh, a belief that they uh, have a greater propensity of supporting your candidate. Um, so I, I think the, 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 actually the results of the election um, uh, kind of belie the premise of the question, which is that there weren't folks that were able to, to register to vote that, uh, that wanted to vote. But how would you respond to the criticism that even if folks were able to register to vote, it was made harder to do so uh, based on uh, certain factors that correlated in a very interesting way with racial background, with your economic background? Yeah, I just don't think it's true. You don't think it's true? I just don't all? think it's true, no. At, and, and, and I would say that because if you look at, at, at precincts in my old congressional district, for example, what, which uh, uh, normally uh, would, uh, would be considered democratic precincts, um, they, uh, a precinct in our area usually has four to 5,000 red, potential registered voters, individuals who are able to qualify to vote. Uh, there's some precincts that would vote, oh, I don't know, 350, 400 people routinely in an election. In this election, uh, those, those precincts were voting 2,500, 3,000 individuals. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's not, it's not that, that, they, that they were uh, precluded from registering to vote or precluded from voting. It's that they did, the other, the other team, from my perspective, did a much better job this time of their ground game of getting people out, the grassroots activity that's necessary in order to get people out to vote. And the, the final question for me before we move to the audience then is um, with uh, our Republicans having lost control of the House, to what extent do you think genuine health care reform will be possible before 2020? Uh, I, I think it's possible. I, th I think the question becomes um, whether or not the, the, the majority party now uh, in the new Congress, in the House of Representatives, uh, wants to try to solve problems or wants to tee up an election for their presidential nominee in 2020. Um, and and, and that, those are two different things. You get two different types of governance when, depending on how you answer that question. Um, if if, uh, if the, majority, the incoming majority party wants to solve problems, then I think there are folks of goodwill who will be interested in solving problems in the area of health care. And as I mentioned, there, there's a genuine consensus on both sides of the aisle in the House that, that there are problems and challenges in, in health care. Um, and they can, be, they can be solved, but it's going to take a bipartisan solution. From our perspec perspective, we've seen what happens when you have a partisan health care solution. It was the ACA, and, and I would suggest to you that it has not resulted in a significant improvement in either the health care uh, or the health quality that's, uh, that is delivered in the United States. Great. Thank you. Let's move to questions from the audience now. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand and then wait for the, the microphone to reach you. Let's first go to the hand in the, in the middle here. Thank you. Um, 
First of all, thank you very much for your, your talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought your sort of exposition of um, the problems America faces in its healthcare and also the diversity of the system was um, both fascinating and, and very well done. So thank you for that. Um, I was just thinking, in the debate over health provision in this country, we're often presented with a sort of black or white debate between the NHS we have in this country and that form of medical provision and a sort of US-style system, which is sort of characterised as having no support and having um, no access for many people from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, but I just wondered, from your experiences and from your knowledge, is there any country in the world that you think has a very good healthcare system that you think America or, and or Britain should emulate in future? Well, as I mentioned, I, th I think it's important to break down the different aspects of healthcare. If you talk about the clinical quality aspects of healthcare, then both the US and, and, and the UK have, a, have an excellent system if you're able to access it and, and if you access it at the, at the correct time uh, for, for whatever your, 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 your disease or malady is. Um, the challenges are uh, coverage and getting folks into the system and, and the kind of education process that encourages folks to get into the system because there's this variable out there called human, human activity, right? I mean, you, uh, I mentioned uh, motor vehicle accidents and gunshot wounds and overdoses. So some of that is, is, is decision making by individuals that drive down our quality numbers when in fact if, if, you, aren't, if you don't participate in those activities or aren't unfortunate enough uh, to have one of those, those activities, then the, the level of quality care can be as high as anywhere else uh, in, in the world. So um, when we focus on coverage, getting folks in the system, um, and, and marrying that with a system that I think um, uh, allows patients to have greater input into what that system looks like, I think Switzerland is probably the, 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 the best example which basically allows everybody to take a, 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 um, a portion of resources, a portion of money, and purchase the kind of coverage that they want. So there's a private, if you will, system of, of, insuring, um, of insuring and coverage, and the patients have resources to be able to access that. The government doesn't run the healthcare system. Now for the states, it's a little more challenging because of the size. We're, we're, for every other system that, that, that's out there that's oftentimes used as an example for the states, we, we're, we're five, six, ten times larger than whatever that example is. And culturally we're different around the nation and the distances are huge. So for example in Alaska there are, uh, are over, as I recall, over 600 communities that have no access by road. You've got to fly into them or you're, you're, you're just there. Um, that's a completely different health system than metropolitan Atlanta. Um, and you have to have a flexible system and one that's able to be, be flexible enough to respond to those challenges, both with, with resources, but also, also with structure within, within the system itself. Great, thank you. Next question, please. Yes, let's go to the uh, gentleman on the aisle here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming. Um, the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services documented that you wasted over $341,000 of taxpayer m uh, money during your brief tenure as Secretary of Health and Human Services. That's more than triple what my wife and I made last year for our combined income. My question is how you sleep at night wasting that kind of taxpayer money. That's a good UK question. Um, Actually, it's a good U.S. question. You could ask that over there as well. Um, it, it, I would suggest to you that the, the, the facts that you stated um, are um, in dispute, one, and two, that you didn't include the most important fact in that Inspector General's report, which was that every single trip that I took was authorized and approved by the department before I took it, that it was all within budget, and that they were all for official business. So um, the, 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 the question that, that, that arose was whether or not these were appropriate trips. So for the first time ever, the Inspector General of the of Health and Human Services Department determined, this is, this is an Inspector General determining whether or not there was wasted, wasted money. This is $341,000, by the way, in a budget of $1.1 trillion, important. Um, and and uh, the, the, uh, the Inspector General, for the first time ever, um, had, had a, uh, a qualitative judgment as to whether or not a trip that I took to uh, rural uh, Ohio, for example, 
to sit down with folks about and talk about the opioid crisis in an area that has actually seen some improvement, whether that was an appropriate trip for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Now, I would suggest to you that the Inspector General knows nothing about what's an, an appropriate activity for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. But I was pleased that the, General, the Inspector General's report showed that every trip was approved and every trip was, was authorized before I took it. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, let's go to the hand just here, the gentleman in the suit. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And um, on a slightly wider uh, question, a similar kind of thing, but um, there are many other Trump appointees who've had similar or other types of ethical problems, whether that be Secretary Zinka or Administrator Pruitt. Do you think in the Trump administration generally there's a wider problem with either <laughs> corruption or negligence or ethical problems, and that, is that something that the administration could do better to avoid coming to these issues in the future? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I, I, I don't think so. I, I do think that the press has been, uh, been uh, remarkably um, uh, aggressive, or if, you, if you're uh, in favor of the kinds of things that they report, you, want, you would say diligent in, in, in identifying uh, uh, certain, certain challenges, if you will. For example, the previous Secretary of, of Transportation in, in the previous administration, in the Obama administration, took 131 trips at a cost of significant millions of dollars to his home for no official business at all. Now, the press didn't cover that, and, 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 and nobody would have known about, about my official activity if the press hadn't distorted <laughs> what, what, what they did. So uh, the, the, the key, the principle here, however, is that the president needs to be surrounded with the individuals that he or she believes is most appropriate to solving the challenges of the nation. And so uh, it, it, we all serve, and, and when, when I went into office, I understood that I served at the pleasure of the president. That's the statement that's, that, that's used when you, when you sign up for the job. Um, and if you lose the pleasure of the president, then it's the president's prerogative to find somebody else. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, let's go to the hand at the back here. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was wondering if you could address the gender gap in healthcare. Um, women are, generally speaking, significantly less likely to be included in medical studies, and yet women's bodies metabolize medications differently. Women are um, most likely to die from cardiovascular disease, yet they're only one third of the population in every single health um, heart study. And um, when you were referencing pain as a vital sign, you know, women do experience pain differently from men. And I uh, wondered if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's something that, that from a scientific basis, uh, needs, to, needs, to be, uh, needs to be addressed. Um, and, and would encourage um, folks who are doing scientific studies to make certain that we're answering all of the kinds of questions that need to be answered for all members of our society. One of the, one of the, one of the areas that's, that's not talked about uh, much at all is that, that children, actually there's a, there's a child gap, if you will, in terms of research, uh, because most of the medications that are prescribed for children, both here and in the States, have no studies that have been done on kids, none. So we treat kids as just little people when in fact they are more than little people. They're, they're, they're metabolically and, and physiologically uh, in many ways significantly different. Um, and so uh, um, I, I think you know, science is an evolving activity. It's a dynamic activity. And so the more we learn, the more it, it allows us to inform the decisions that we make for the benefit of, of, uh, of in, in, in the area of health, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for this case, for, for the benefit of, of patients. Um, I don't think there is a concerted um, effort to not provide the highest quality information so that individuals can, can, can treat uh, their female patients uh, as well as, as, as they uh, possibly can or can treat kids as well as they possibly can. Uh, but it's an, it, it, it's an evolution that has to occur and it's a, a question of, uh, of focus um, and would, would encourage people to do so. It is interesting, however, that women live longer than men in the States. So, you, so it, I mean, you, you, you have, to, have to answer the question, what, what, what's going on there? Are there issues that, that we're not looking at in terms of, of, of male health uh, that, are, uh, that are not able to allow males to be able to live as long as, as women? I would, I would prefer to live as long as, uh, as, as, my, as my wife, who will outlive me for sure. But, um. Next question, please. Yeah, let's go to the back on the other side. 
you. Hi, thank you for speaking this evening. Um, the United States has a very high maternal uh, mortality rate among developed countries. It has the highest among well-developed countries, um, and it's actually increasing right now. Um, when I'm not here, I live in Virginia, and that's one of the places where it really is increasing, places like Virginia and Texas that have large distances between uh, rural populations and hospitals and cities and um, more urban areas. Um, and it, uh, part of the reason for for this mater this increase is that um, hospitals in rural areas are closing, and if whole hospitals aren't closing, then at least maternity wards are, and that's through a combination of something that you um, mentioned, which is the scarcity of doctors that we have, and it's also because people in these areas can't afford their health care. It's either they can't afford the insurance or they can't pay afford to pay outright, and so it's not... Um, financially viable for these hospitals to stay open or to keep these um, maternity wards open. What do you think are some solutions um, in the immediate to solve these problems? You said, you know, we're not going to have an increase in doctors. We're not going to um, cover this doctor shortage. And um, obviously, it's more complicated to um, increase the number of insured people. Um, so what do you think are some short-term solutions to make sure that women um, and um, expectant mothers are getting the health care that they need? That's a great question, <clears throat> and it's a real problem. But you've got to unpack the question a little bit. Um, is, is there a problem with, with, with uh, uh, maternal mortality and infant mortality in, in, uh, in, in the states? Absolutely is in certain areas. And it gets to the point that I made about, about an, a non-uniform provision of services in the states for all sorts of reasons. Um, availability of physicians, uh, rural areas being far from, from, uh, from folks who can, who can provide care, um, uh, lack of education in certain instances for individuals to be able to appreciate the kind of care uh, that, that, that they need and therefore a lack, uh, lack of, uh, of access. Um, it, it's also important to appreciate that the United States measures at least infant mortality, in, in different ways than many WHO countries, which is where most of these statistics come from, uh, than, than many uh, World Health Organization countries measure. So there's some world WHO countries, or there's some countries that are included in WHO stats, where if the, if the, the, ch the child that's born, the baby that's born, doesn't survive at least a week, then they aren't counted in the infant mortality. The U.S., as I understand it, it the, is, is immediate from immediately at, at the time of birth, and the child has to survive for a year in order to be, to be um, included in surviving and not being a, a, a victim of, of, of infant mortality. So we're not comparing apples to apples, and, 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 uh, and I think it's important to compare apples to apples so that you, you, you can actually direct resources and make a correct diagnosis about what the problem is. But in terms of what the solution is, it, it is absolutely vital and imperative that we increase availability of services in the rural and, and, and uh, uh, extra rural areas of our nation. Uh, there, there, uh, uh, there are ways to do that. It's, it is costly. It oftentimes uh, requires uh, some travel for individuals, and, and that, needs to be, uh, that needs to obviously be available. It requires an increase in education for folks in, in, in rural areas uh, about the need for attended uh, deliveries and prenatal care. Oftentimes the challenges that moms have is because they aren't getting the kind of prenatal care that they, that they need. Um, and it, and it, it absolutely needs to be addressed. So I think it's a, it's a problem. My con one of the concerns that I have is that, that when policymakers are, are the ones that are trying to, are, are the ones solving the problem, they tend to throw resources at the problem without an actual solution. I think the solutions come from those who are actually out there in the communities providing the care you know in rural Virginia, I'm sure, about the folks who, ha who know so well about how you can actually get resources and care to individuals in those rural communities. I don't think we use those folks as much as we should from a solutions standpoint. Great, thank you. Next question, please. Let's go to the, uh, the person in the aisle here, in the glasses and scarf. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You talked earlier about how there's presently a realignment of the political parties on both the left and the right. On the right side of the political aisle, uh, where do you see the Republican Party moving in a kind of post-Trump world? So say Trump is re-elected in 2020 or he's not re-elected. In 2024, what do you see as kind of the, kind of, uh, the perfect Republican candidate in a post-Trumpian Republican party? <laughs> um. 
Well, I, I think the question is whether or not this realignment is actually going to occur, or whether this is a blip in, that, that, that we sometimes see in, in the U.S. history in terms of ideological affinity of folks for, for either party. And as I say, we're in the middle of it. I don't know the answer to that. I would tell you that there are folks who, who are, are strong believers in, in, um, uh, in, in free markets, in, in, um, uh, in, in free trade, uh, free and fair trade. Um, and, and in the kind of solutions that, that, uh, that don't include the, the, um, the amount of spending that we've seen uh, in, in the United States. I, I didn't put my budget hat at all on uh, this evening, and if I, if I did, I would tell you that the United States has a, has a, 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 a debt that is larger than 100% of its gross domestic product, and if you know anything about economics, you know that, that when nations get to that level of debt, it becomes increasingly difficult to finance that debt, and at some point, uh, the economics don't lie, and you've got to, there'll, there'll be a reckoning, and, and that reckoning is an equal opportunity destroyer of lies because you have to monetize the debt and inflate your way out of, out, out of that debt, and that's not comfortable for anybody. And for us as a society to ignore that, as policymakers to ignore that, which I think is basically what has been done through both Republican and Democratic administrations, I think, I think that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a responsible tack to take. So the, uh, the people will decide what, what ideological uh, group uh, they believe uh, uh, um, uh, will, will, will form the majority that will allow for the, 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 uh, the governance of the nation at two-year intervals or four-year intervals for, for the president. And we'll see whether this is a, whether this is a shift that, that has any permanency to it. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. I really don't know. Uh, um, it's going to be fascinating to live through. Um, and for, for uh, um, those of us who were in the conventional Republican Party, we uh, will we'll continue to work and, and try to be certain that, 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 that the tenets and principles of that party uh, survive. Great. Let's just take two more questions. So let's first go to the other hand on the aisle right here. Uh, so with regards to this quote-unquote uh, realignment or blip, uh, I'm sure you're aware a large part of that is the movement of suburban women towards the Republicans and the Democrats, and that you know caused Lucy McBath to win your old seat, of course. And uh, I was wondering what you what you think, or whether you think the Republican Party should make any effort to court back those suburban women, or whether you should just accept that as uh, part of that realignment process. And if so, if they if they do attempt to court back those Republican uh, those former suburb, uh, Republican supporters, those suburban women. Uh, what that would look like? Does that come from Trump changing uh, his own behavior? Does that come from uh, an alteration in messaging from the minority leader designate McCarthy or the NRCC? What's that going to look like in the future? Yeah, I think. Uh, um, I mean, I when I, I ran for office, uh, I think I ran. I can't remember twenty plus elections, both primary and in and, and, and general, over a period of twenty plus years. Um, and I, I never believed that there were certain voters that ought to ignore and certain voters that ought to attend to. Um, my perspective was that, you, that it was important to lay out a vision, lay out principles about how you would make decisions when it comes to, to governing and, and policy making, um, and try to, um, try to attract as many people as possible to that vision and to those principles. Um, I believe that when Republicans, conservatives slash conservatives do that and, and, and demonstrate and articulate why it is important that the United States be governed in a, in a conservative manner um, because it, it creates greater opportunity and greater s amount of success and, and, and greater amount uh, of, of, of choices for all, um, then we prevail. Uh, when, when we get focused on, on more narrow things, and, and, uh, uh, and in this last instance I would suggest that we became complacent um, uh, uh, in terms of our political ground game, um, then, then the other side has an equal opportunity to try to convince those same voters um, to, to support them. Um, the good news is, is that most Americans don't pay attention to this uh, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Um, they, they just want people to solve problems. They just want people to solve challenges. Uh, they know there are, are solutions that exist out there, and they know that problems uh, need, need to be solved. Um, and so I, I would put less emphasis on, on the party uh, and more emphasis on um, the principles and the governing posture and policy and, and, and uh, position 
that, that, that folks uh, ought to take and then how to articulate that in a positive way uh, towards solving the challenges that we've got in the States. Thank you. Um, for the final question, let's go to the hand at the back here. The further back, it's a white shirt or jumper. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for your speech today. Um, so you were speaking about how the um, health healthcare system in the US for those who can access it uh, is really sort of top quality in the world. Um, growing up in various emerging markets, specifically in Latin America, uh, I've definitely seen how elites in those markets recognize that. And I was wondering if you have a view on the effect of um, medical tourism in the US healthcare industry, whether that's a positive effect or a negative effect. What? Well, it's a market effect, isn't it? I mean, for those that have resources and they decide that they don't, that they can't get the kind of treatment or uh, either from an efficient standpoint or, or a quality standpoint or a responsiveness standpoint or an innovation standpoint, um, and those that have resources then go where they want to go to, to receive care. Um, so I think, I think medical tourism, which is folks leaving their, their, their home country to go elsewhere for medical care for, for a specific uh, a disease, um, is not something that, 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 is a, that is a bad thing, but it is symptomatic of a system that may not be responding in the best way to their population. And that's true for every nation. We used to talk about folks who had the, 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 the largest the, the, the incredible wealth from around the world in nations that were developing nations, and where did they go for their health care? They oftentimes came to the states for their health care. That's, that's a medical tourism. Now, the, 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 that means that that nation didn't have the quality of health care that even their leaders felt was, was uh, 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 appropriate for them to receive care. So my, uh, I, would, I would turn that around and say what, what our goal in the states ought to be, and, and, and every nation's goal ought, ought to be, but, uh, but in, in, uh, I've got the area of, of the states to, to be concerned about, is to make certain that, that our health system is one that can provide uh, access to all, affordability for all, highest quality of care that can be delivered, and provide patients the choices to, res to, to make, the privilege to make those choices, for who's treating them where, when, and, and, and the like. And if, you, and if you have that as your goal, it's probably an unattainable goal, but that doesn't mean it's not your goal um, and, and, and your vision or what you ought to, ought to, ought to work toward. So um, I wouldn't, I, I, think, I think medical tourism is more of a symptom of the system as, in, in, as opposed to a solution to, to uh, a long-term problem. Great, thank you very much. That unfortunately brings us to the end of our event, but I wanna thank you so much for coming here and sharing your insights uh, it's fantastic, actually, the problems such as healthcare, which is normally only talked about such a general and political level to get into the details. It's absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.